started. So welcome to lesson four. Uh, this is the final lesson of the day where we look at carbon and functional groups as a whole. Uh, this is kind of like a, a super important aspect, just like water when we look at the biochemistry of science, specifically biology. Uh, carbon is the other, I would say, important aspect that we need to think about, consider, what have you. Uh, because carbon is, is quite magical with the way that it can behave in terms of organic compounds. Uh, so when you think about what you already know about carbon and its compounds, and when you look at the Lewis dot diagram for carbon, as well as the location of it on the periodic table, uh, it's very easy for you to start to see some patterns that arise as a result of, or that allude to how important carbon is as a whole. So when we look at carbon's valence electrons, it has four valence electrons, which is when you know how, think about how valence electrons work, it's right smack dab in the middle of willing to give and willing to take. If one electron in its valence shell is really willing to give and seven valence electrons is really willing to take on electrons, four is right smack dab in the middle of it. So it provides an interesting property to carbon that allows it to behave the way that it does, which means it can also bond four times. So carbon can form four total bonds with other atoms or other molecules, which allows for it to do some special things. So how many bonds can carbon form with another carbon? Well, it can form up to three carbon bonds with itself, single, double, and triple bonds with itself. So ultimately, what is a hydrocarbon? Well, a hydrocarbon is a compound that's made of hydrogen and carbon, and it's any type of single, double, or triple bond carbon compound that comprises of that hydrogen and carbon. So we have alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. The name itself isn't too important uh, for your understanding with regards to biology as a whole, uh, but again, it's one of those things where it's something that's important for you to recognize and make those connections with as you move through this course. So based on what you know about electronegativity, shape of molecules, how would hydrocarbons typically behave? Do you think they'd behave as polar or nonpolar? Again, recall, what makes it polar or nonpolar? If it's spending more time with electrons, it's going to be polar negative. It's just, if it's spending more time away from electrons, polar positive. So carbon actually behaves as nonpolar. And it's, it has to do with the fact that because carbon and hydrogen are ubiquitous in living things, and, and those carbon skeletons, they represent all of those aspects of, of carbon bonds and hydrocarbons as a whole, it's important to connect the idea of that nonpolar carbon, hydrocarbon uh, together. Because it, it's, it's really so important to understand how many different things these hydrocarbons are a part of. Uh, and the reason why it's nonpolar uh, has to do with many of the reasons that nonpolar substances that we've looked at in the past kind of behave. So the share, equal sharing of electrons between those hydrogen and those carbons is really what yields to that nonpolar nature. That um, symmetrical shape along an axis uh, really lends itself to that nonpolar, uh, those nonpolar characteristics. And the, when you really think about it, that nonpolar aspect, which makes it not react with water, allows for a lot of cool things to happen. So when we look at those atoms inside of a hydrocarbon, oops, uh, the key thing here I want you to look at and understand is that even though there are lots of chains in this one example of the hydrocarbon that I've shown you, in terms of how long it is or how wide or tall it is, uh, recognize that it's still for the most part pretty symmetrical, meaning electrons spend an equal amount of time on the outside parts as they do on the inside carbons. Uh, so the key things I want you to draw attention to oops, is that these bends or kinks along here, they have to do with carbon and hydrogen atoms connecting and bonding with each other. And they kind of push and pull away from each other to form that general shape. As you add in more carbons or as you add in more bonds or hydrogen atoms, it can change the shape. And if it changes the shape, it can change the function of that hydrocarbon. So let's take a look at the major classes of biological molecules as they relate to hydrocarbons. This is kind of like the, the be all end all with regards to some aspects that we're gonna study. And I'll, I'll, go, I'll go over the nice chart that will be able to hopefully draw connections to all of those uh, hydrocarbons that we're gonna look at. So uh, these carbon-based biological compounds are what's forming up 
uh, of what we call polymers. And it combines those smaller subunits called monomers oops, together. So when we think about those monomers and those classes of molecules, uh, there's a couple of things that, oh, spoiled it too early. There's a couple of things that come up that are quite important in the term uh, or in the course of grade 12 bi university biology. And it's those macromolecules that we're gonna look at tomorrow, but I'll give you a brief, a brief overview of them today. So a carbohydrate, is a class of molecule. It's those sugars, it's uh, those starches, it's all of those saccharides that are formed up of the monomer, monosaccharide. And one example of that polymer would be starch. So it's a bunch of monosaccharides that come together in such a way that form what's called a starch. We then have lipids, those fatty acids. Monomers make up the larger polymer and one example of a larger polymer is that triglyceride. Those triglycerides are what allow for cells to form shapes. And those cells can form shapes of spheres, of, of oblong spheroids, all sorts of different shapes. But it ultimately can separate one group of water and everything that's inside of that water content away from another group of water contents. And I'll explain more what I mean by that as we go through. But it essentially means that cells can form a shell of, wa of fatty acids around a group of water that contains dissolved minerals, other groups of, of lipids, et cetera, and it can create the underpinning of a general cell structure, and that can be existing in a world where it may not necessarily have the opportunity to exist. Proteins are formed up of amino acids, and a pep polypeptide is an example of polymer. These are the things that make up the general structures of cells and allow for it to function as a whole. And lastly, we look at nucleic acids, which are nucleotides for the monomer component, and the example polymer would be DNA and RNA. So these are some different, the four different classes of the biological molecules we're gonna spend a lot of time with in this unit, as well as in other units um, moving forward. So it's important that this is just a general overview. We'll spend a full day tomorrow on each of them. Uh, so we'll cross that through joint. Functional groups allow for all of those things I listed above to behave differently in some way, shape, or form. So different proteins, different lip lipids, different nucleic acids, different carbs, they all have different functional groups that are attached to the major general structure of them. And as a result of those functional groups, they can behave differently. So these functional groups are typically uh, charged and, and or strongly polar. And as you add on different functional groups to different backbone molecules, it can really change the way that it behaves as a result of that polar nature. So this makes them very attracted to other polar things. And we looked at a very, very important polar uh, solvent earlier this morning when we talked about water and why it's so important for water to be that, that polar solvent that it is. It allows for water to interact with these functional groups, which are attached to these molecules, which as you'll start to see as we move through this class, allows for different different interactions to take place that are all very necessary. So again, when we look at the idea of uh, decanol, which is a fat, we can talk about its ability to form nonpolar structures as well as have polar components. So as we move through the lipids and the phospholipids and bilipid layers, uh, of, of lipids and fatty acids, and we look at how those create the underpinning cellular membranes of cells, you'll start to see why it's important that we understand what are polar and nonpolar, hydrophobic versus hydrophilic, and how that structure and those chemical structures allow for the general physical and biological structures to do what they do. So now I'm gonna look at each of the different functional groups in, in biological molecules. Um, and the one thing I wanna just make sure that everyone is aware of is that when we talk about R in this context, it refers to the rest of the organic molecule. It could be a carbohydrate, it could be a lipid, it could be a, uh, a nucleotide, it could be any of those other four that I talked about. The R just is that general structure, that hydrocarbon, whatever it might be, that it, it would be attached to. These functional groups are what make it chemically different from each other. So let's take a look at our first functional group. That is a hydroxyl group. It can be a component of carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, as well as fats. And it is denoted by the diagram of R, 
an OH. And that OH, that hydroxyl group here, that's what sets it apart from other things that we're going to look at in this lesson. So again, recall that R value is responsible or is, is associated with any of the different molecules that we've talked about so far. So when I highlight that R, it could be a carbohydrate attached, it could be a protein attached, nucleic acid, it could be a fat. It's really, it, it can be mixed and matched. And that hydroxyl group behaves differently depending on which of those biological molecules it is attached to. So the next we have a carbonyl group. Oh, I'll, I'll get to your question, Andrew, after I finish uh, uh, the lesson, but that's a very good question. I'll talk about that after I finish, okay? So carbohydrates and fats are, are where the carbonyl groups are found. And the carbonyl group looks like this. So there's two different classes of carbonyl groups. There is an aldehyde and there is a ketone. The aldehyde is bound, double bound to an oxygen. Like so that the carbonyl group, they're all double bound to oxygen. But the key difference maker here for that aldehyde is that it's also attached to a hydrogen. And then we have our stereotypical, the normal R value or R that is going to be that carbohydrate or that fat that it's attached to. Meanwhile, for the ketone, we have that double bond O still, but we also have another R group. So it could be that carbohydrate that it's attached to, another carbohydrate, a different carbohydrate, a different fat, what have you. But those R's represent those biological organic molecule classes that we talked about before, just in this previous, uh, on the previous slide or previous page or whatever. So that can be mixed and matched with different R's, which are those carbohydrates or fats. But again, that key thing here for a carbonyl group is that it's double bound to an O. So the, the most important thing, the most important thing to recognize that when you think about that carbonyl or that hydroxyl group, um, even though it might have a property in chemistry such as an alcohol, alcohol or uh, an aldehyde ketone or what have you, um, here we're just looking at the functional group, right? So that OH, that hydroxyl, that OH, when it's attached to a specific uh, R value, it could be an alcohol, right? It could be an alcohol. When it's attached to a specific protein, it would be something completely different. It wouldn't be considered an alcohol anymore because in order for it to be an alcohol, it has to be attached to a specific, um, a specific carbohydrate or a specific um, car hydrocarbon chain. If it's just the OH attached to other things, we're talking about the hydroxyl group. So when we look at the carboxyl group, here we're looking at, it's going to be C double bound to O, and then either an OH or an O, and that can transfer to and from depending on the nature or what we need it to do. And we'll talk more about that in terms of amino acids and fats, because when we look at how fats are broken down and digested, we're going to have to understand how those carboxyl groups are changed to and from from those two different versions. But again, the key thing here you have to recognize is that it's double bound to O, just like that carbonyl group, but it's also bound to this OH here. So we have that C double bound O again, but then we also have either it being bound to OH or an O that has one extra electron. Okay, the next one we're gonna look at is an ether. These are only ever attached to carbohydrates and they have the functional groups uh, of O being bound to R on either side. So an ether is bound just one oxygen that connects two different uh, carbohydrates together. An ester is for with fats and nucleic acids only and much like its ether, or much like an ether I should say, it has that O that's bound to an R but it also has that C double bound O. And then it also has another R group, either a fat or a nucleic acid on either side. So much just like this ether up here with an R on either side, it's very similar except for that C double bound O. The amino acids or amino groups are only ever gonna be associated with amino acids. And it is denoted by either a functional group, oops, a functional group on one side with an N and either one hydrogen or in this case, three hydrogens oops. with an extra proton 
available or missing one electron. So it's again, it's the key thing here for that amino acid is that it has that R group attached at some point to a nitrogen, which is the big difference maker from anything we've ever seen so far. And then it has hydrogens attached to it in some way, shape or form. And then lastly, the phosphate group on nucleic acids, as you can imagine, it's going to incorporate a phosphorus group. And that phosphorus group is that key differentiator. It can either have a bunch of oxygens attached to it. It can have a hydroxyl group attached to it. It can have two hydroxyl groups attached to it, or it can be all oxygens, one being double bound, and then that carbon chain or that nucleic acid chain here. Okay, that's a lot to take in. I, I recognize that. That's why I wanna try to make sure um, that we finish this up and we have some time to go over it all because it is a lot of information to, oops, to digest. Uh, so I just wanna make sure that we spend some proper time looking at it today. So the last point I wanna make with regards to this, uh, there are three charged functional groups, okay? The charges meaning that they have uh, an ionic charge, okay? The carboxyl group, amino group, and phosphate group, all right? And they can behave as acids or bases. In this case, we have uh, the carboxyl group behaving as an acid. And then we have the amino group behaving as a base. And then the phosphate group behaves as an acid. This allows for them to be hydrophilic in some way, shape, or form. It has that bit of charge, meaning that will not want to kind of interact with, or sorry, it will kind of want to interact with water because it takes on that ionic charge and it can disassociate as a result of that. So if you put a carboxyl group attached to whatever uh, that R group might be, if you put that in water, it will want to disassociate and it will want to form uh, those polar connections or those polar hydrogen bonds with water. And as a result of that, it can take on some uh, pretty fancy properties. So the last thing I, oops, the last thing I want to just talk about with regards to uh, the idea of functional groups is that when we think about that condensation or that hydrolysis reaction, those functional groups are often going to be gaining or losing hydrogen or hydroxyl groups. And these are gonna make up those components of water. So during a chemical reaction, if you recall back to that importance uh, of condensation and hydrolysis reactions we talked about in the first lesson, where we looked at uh, condensation forming water and hydrolysis using water to break stuff apart, each of those things are gonna look at those functional groups uh, specifically the hydrogen ion and hydroxyl groups to make or use that to create water to, to catalyze a reaction, okay? So the practice functional group identification, which is in the Google Drive that I've shared with you for unit one, student notes, uh, that's gonna be your practice after you kind of finish filling in some of these notes. Um, and so I'll stop recording here. I think I answered the question uh, that I believe it was Andrew who asked. Uh, yeah, Andrew asked a question with regards to alcohols and chemistry, because in chemistry, yeah, you're looking at an alcohol, but that hydroxyl group is attached to a very specific hydrocarbon to make it an alcohol. If it's attached to an amino acid or if it's attached to an, uh, a fatty acid, it's no longer going to be an alcohol. It's just a hydroxyl group attached to those things. Okay, so that sums up our lesson for our final lesson for the day. Uh, I'm going to stop recording here, and if you have other questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them.